We love talking about old games sometimes, so today we're gonna talk about great PlayStation 2 games that are seemingly ignored today. This is all opinion, of course, but we wanted to highlight games that are underrated gems, and we also wanted to highlight some games that reached some epic heights but are basically extinct or not talked about in 2020. There's so much to cover, and we can't even fit all the games in one video, so consider this an ongoing series. Anyways, uh, there's a lot of fun stuff to talk about, so let's get started off with number 10 and talk about Jet Li, Rise to Honor. This 2004 game was actually a total surprise, and I feel like we'd never get a game like this now in 2020. Essentially, what it was was a third-person action adventure game starring Jet Li. Like, straight up real actual Jet Li in the height of his career in his prime. He provided his likeness, voice acting, motion capture for all the fight moves and stuff like that, and the game was a surprising amount of fun. It was a good mix of a lot of fun brawling and occasional shootouts and stuff that was just paced really well. For the time, the fighting was a little weird. It was very much of the time where you'd have to use the analog stick to hit in different directions, but still, it was a ton of fun, and we don't get games like this anymore, just action hero games, you know? It went on to sell a lot of copies. It was a big hit. It became like a PlayStation 2 greatest hits game, but that was it. We never got like a remaster, re-release, or anything else. Now over at number nine, speaking of things that need a re-release or a remaster, that's Freedom Fighters from 2003, developed by IO Interactive, hot off the heels of the also excellent Hitman 2, Silent Assassin. They changed gears here with uh, more of a third-person shooter action game where you are Chris Stone, a plumber in New York City, when suddenly it's invaded by the Soviets. So you basically get thrust into this resistance and you fight your way through New York City battling the Soviets and, and slowly becoming more and more of a badass resistance fighter, all while building up your resistance camp, becoming leader, and eventually leading New Yorkers and the rest of America to freedom. The shooting mechanics were kind of wonky at the time, but commanding troops and sending them into battle was a lot of fun, especially for what was otherwise just a straightforward third-person game. The team mechanics was a lot of fun. It was fast-paced. It had some epic music by Jesper Kidd. The vibe and atmosphere was perfect. This game is truly special. It's hard to put my finger on why, but we've talked about this so many times. If you guys know me, you know I love Freedom Fighters. IO Interactive does technically have the rights now, I believe, but uh, who knows if we'll ever see a sequel. Now over at number eight, another game that people really forget about, this one is totally ignored, especially in terms of licensed games, it's The Thing. Yes, they made a game in 2002 called The Thing, based off of John Carpenter's classic genre-defining movie, straight up. It, it takes place after the events of the movie, but essentially you have to explore an Arctic base, fighting off against an unknown threat and managing your teammates. The game's most unique feature was essentially you managing the fear and sanity level of your teammates. They, they could see gore, they could see violence, and slowly become more and more stressed out and eventually trigger a freak out mode where they can hurt you, themselves, or just like straight up have a heart attack out of stress and die. And this all of course is because of the tension, the lack of trust. If you saw the Thing movie, you know that there is an underlying theme of uh, who is real, who's not. The fact that they took that concept and made it an actual gameplay mechanic made the game really succeed. Movie fans, game fans really loved this thing, and that was it, it was just a flash in the pan. I would love a modern update or, or something, but still, it still exists, you can go back and play it at least. Now over at number seven, we have 13 from 2003. Based off a Belgian comic book slash graphic novel, this was a first person shooter that at first glance looks kind of just like a time splitters type thing, but the cell shaded art style and presentation really knocked it out of the park. It was very spy, thriller, archer style stuff with sound effects that actually popped up in the air like bang bang bang, like kind of like the old Batman TV show. Uh, there would be picture in picture moments where you'd get a headshot or like a cutscene would be happening on the side, all in the style of making it feel like you're playing on a comic book page and it actually worked. It kind of elevated just like an okay playing first person shooter to the next level with just story, atmosphere, voice acting, stuff like that. This was really like a unique game for the time that people really liked, especially considering cell shaded games were kind of a dime a dozen at the time. This one took a really creative approach. And although this one is kind of ignored today, it is actually getting a PS4 version pretty soon. So keep your eyes peeled for that. 
Now, next up at number six, we're talking Animusha Warlords, released in 2001. This is an interesting one. You know, after Resident Evil, it was awesome to get like a ninja survival horror game. That's how me and a lot of other kids dubbed it. Just like Resident Evil, it had pre-rendered backgrounds with a fixed camera. There were puzzles, but unlike Resident Evil, it had a bigger focus on combat. You're a man with a sword, so of course they were gonna give you some really fun action moments. And you were fighting awesome monstrous demons too. People really loved it. It reviewed very well, sold tons of copies, actually being the first PS2 game to sell a million copies, eventually surpassing two million units sold. There were sequels and spin-offs. There was a third game with French actor Jean Reno. That was a thing, that was weird. After all those games and the newer generations, uh, things kind of died down for the Animusha series. It was pretty quiet until uh, a remaster of the first game that released in 2019, which was cool, but that was about it. Besides that, Capcom has seemed to have left the series behind, which is a bummer because they had something really cool and different. And hopefully a day comes where Capcom decides that the world is in need of another Animusha game, but we'll see. Now over at number five, let's talk about Red Faction. Let's talk about Red Faction 1 and 2, because while the games like Red Faction Guerrilla did go on to current generation and become big hits, the original games are totally forgotten. So Red Faction 1, released in 2001, was a PS2 first person shooter, and it was pretty good. It took place on Mars, it was all about revolution, and it had some really interesting mechanics in terms of destructibility. You could have a rocket launcher shoot it into a cave wall and continue to just blow holes deeper and deeper into that wall in, in like a realistic fashion. It was a lot of fun, it was gory, it was very sci-fi, and then followed up right in 2002 with Red Faction 2. This one's forgotten about even more, but it had a sweet spot in my heart. It was a little bit more arcadey, over the top, action-y, Really fun though, with some exciting weapons, some good dual wielding, and a really interesting like sci-fi fascist vibe with some great split screen play. This one was really underrated and like other games like Time Splitters really kind of steal the show, Red Faction 2 was totally ignored. I want them to bring back not only Red Faction, but bring it back as a first person shooter, man. Now over at number four, 2005's Shadow of Rome is another one that came out, was really cool, but just completely flew under the radar for most people and then went pretty much unnoticed. You know, taking place in ancient Rome, as I'm sure you could have guessed from the title, the game had you play as a centurion named Agrippa. And because of his job, you spent the most of the game just kind of wrecking house. Y you get to do a lot of fun gladiator style combat stuff that you'd expect from a game like this. And it could get pretty wild, letting you chop off enemy limbs and then picking those limbs up and you could beat people to death with them. You know, just cool guy stuff. There was a gameplay system where you could amp up the crowd with certain actions or combinations of actions, which would then grant you salvo points, which would fill a meter, which then when you're full, you could do more crowd work and the audience would throw you rare and more powerful weapons and stuff. It was kind of wild and almost like wrestling. There was like a whole other part of the game focused on vehicle combat and chariot races, which you'd have to come in first or kill everyone. And there were other elements like some weird stealth sections and puzzles. But overall, it was just a really cool Roman style hack and slash get that didn't get enough love at all. And it's Japanese development and influence was actually really apparent. Yes, this was actually a Capcom game, believe it or not, executive produced by the famous producer Keiji Anafune. Yeah, a canceled Shadow of Rome sequel would then go on to become Dead Rising. You don't hear a lot of people mention that. But moving on over to number three, we have PsyOps, The Mindgate Conspiracy. This 2004 multi-platform game was released at a time where there were a lot of games about bald men with psychic powers. I'm looking at you, Second Sight, another game that we don't have time to talk about, but maybe we'll talk about it in another video. This was just like a really fun mid-tier action adventure, super 2000s type of game. Like it was really corny. You were just kind of like a badass dude, but you were able to shoot in third person and also grab things and throw things with your mind and the way the game did it was very intuitive at the time and it made for just like a really special fun dumb good time this is one that was like marketed like hell and a lot of people played it but then that was it there was just a psyops game and then nothing else kind of reminds me of how kill switch kind of innovated with the third person cover system and then that came out and then that was it sometimes it just happens sometimes you have one cool game with a great mechanic that pioneers things and then that's it well thanks for your sacrifice psyops now over at number two, Rez is a prime example of a game that released and pretty much immediately created a, a, a passionate cult following that's managed to still be around to this day, 20 years later. If you've never played, Rez is basically a rhythm-based musical rail shooter put out by Sega for the Dreamcast and then PlayStation 2. And it was produced by Tetsuya Mizuguchi, whose name you might recognize from other games like Space Channel 5, Shenmue, Tetris Effect, and many, many others. 
but the, the game was, like I said, a musical rail shooter, so the gameplay was similar to Panzer Dragoon, but in like a weird trippy digital place. You're like a hacker who's infiltrating a malfunctioning AI to fight off viruses and stuff. Uh, you're fending off enemies, destroying data nodes, and everything you do would change the enemies, the music, most importantly, and the level layout. So you'd kind of be incentivized to go the extra mile so you could really see everything that the game has to offer. It was just a really, really cool game with a unique vibe, an awesome soundtrack, and it's a bummer that like we just don't see new versions of Res today. We've gotten a couple of things, and Res has certainly influenced a lot of other games, but like the Res brand is not really a big thing anymore. But those few Res games and experiences were just like one big hell of a ride. Now over at number one, we have SOCOM US Navy SEALs from Zipper Interactive. Y'all remember this one? This is the first game like right up there with Full Spectrum Warriors, just some of the best and most unique tactical war shooters. SOCOM changed it up a bit because it wasn't too video gamey. And by that I mean like you weren't just running around shooting dudes, like you, you were, but it was different. It was extremely slowed down compared to other shooters. You wanted to sneak your way around and be smart about how you approach certain objectives. And you were also in command of a whole team of SEALs, three to be exact. And the teams were split up into Alpha and Bravo with you making up the half of Alpha. And you could issue commands to everyone or the subgroups and split them up. So you could command Bravo to sit while you went ahead and scattered out the area or something like that. You could issue commands via this on-screen menu, or you could use the SOCOM headset that was packaged in to issue commands with your voice, which was like the coolest shit back in 2002 and really helped to immerse you into the game a bit more. Even if it was a little bit of a gimmick, it was still awesome. Then there was the multiplayer, of course, if you were capable of, of doing it. It was just really different just seeing that this is a slow paced third person shooter. We spent a lot of time with it. Unfortunately, while the series did start with a bang, it ended with a whimper on the PS3 generation with SOCOM 4. It was pretty much an overall bummer, like it had some of the control feel and some of the pace of the original game, but it was buggy and messy and lacked a lot of the overall polish that a lot of other similar games had at the time, and it was all unfortunate. Still, it was a great series in the days of PlayStation 2, and it feels like everyone forgot about it. Those are 10 forgotten games that we wanted to talk about, but there's still so many to talk about. We didn't talk about any JRPGs or horror games, and I, I still want to talk about Metal Arms glitch in the system, so we're probably going to do a part two. So let us know in the comments any forgotten PlayStation 2 games or ignored PlayStation 2 games you want to hear us talk about down there. If you got your own top 10, let us know. If you enjoyed this video on a trip down memory lane, though, clicking the like button's the best way you can help us out. We'd really appreciate that. And if you're new, consider subscribing, maybe pushing that notification bell, because we put out videos every single day. But as always, thanks for watching, and we'll see you guys next time.